I'm Derek Lamartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're building a multi-tenant application, there are a lot of considerations. The first is usually around data. What should you do with it? Should you have a shared database or a database per tenant? I'm going to provide a bunch of different options and illustrate their pros and cons so you understand the trade-offs. So the first option with a shared database, this means that we have tenant A hitting our API or application, connecting, performing operations on our database, and tenant B is hitting the exact same API in the exact same database instance using the exact same schema. That means you need to record the tenant information alongside the data that you're persisting. So that means in my example here of say customer data, tenant ID one owns customer ID one and four, and tenant ID two owns customer ID two and three. It depends what type of database you're using, but if you're using a relational database, I recommend having that tenant information on every single table. Even if it's kind of a child table, it's always there when you're querying it. You don't have to join with other tables. It's always there. Or if you're using a document store, the tenant would own the collection, or maybe an event store, the tenant would own the event stream. So what are the pros and cons and trade-offs? Well, before I get to that, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. EventStoreDB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So what are the pros and cons? Well, the pro is really simplicity. You have a single piece of infrastructure in your database that you have to manage, that you have to deal with. So if you make some type of schema change, you make your code change, when you release that, you do it together, that's the end of it. You're not thinking about all these different instances, it's a single instance that you're dealing with. Now on the con side, the first thing people always bring up, rightfully so, is accidentally leaking data. Let's say we have tenant A and we accidentally show it data from tenant B. One solution to this is just always transparently adding filter information to your queries. My example here using Entity Framework, which is an ORM, is that when we're building our instance, we can have a query filter where we're always passing the tenant information. So we construct our, our instance here of our ORM, any query that we make against this particular entity, this particular table, will automatically filter uh, a where clause when it gets translated to SQL with the tenant information. So it's kind of transparent to the developer. We don't really need to think about it when we're writing queries. It's always going to be there filtering it out for us. That means that every request, we need to know who the tenant is in some way. If you're using some type of bearer token, you can add the tenant ID, a part of the claim. So when you're making that request, the API can get that when it's constructing that instance of our ORM, can pass that along now, and now we can have our query filter. The second con of having a shared database is noisy neighbors, because you have different tenants fighting over resources. Let's say we have tenant A making API calls, there's a limited number of users, everything's fine. Then we have tenant B with a lot more users making a lot more requests that ultimately causes some issues with our database, potentially also with our app and our API. That's gonna affect tenant A that was doing nothing wrong. It's making requests, maybe they're failing now or having degraded performance because everything that tenant B was doing. One solution to this at the database level is having a database user per tenant. So when we make that connection, because we know who the tenant is, just like we're doing our query filter, we're specifying our connection string to using that specific user. That way we can limit the number of connections per tenant. Another solution farther up the stack is rate limiting. Now this is per tenant. So whether you're doing this with your load balancer or in your application through some middleware, the idea is that you're rate limiting per bucket of a tenant. Now, of course, this doesn't completely solve the problem of noisy neighbors because you could still have one tenant, depending on how your system's built, that performs some type of query that's egregious, that takes a really long time, that's ultimately draining resources on your database instance, that's gonna affect other tenants. Now, that may sound like a lot of downsides. Well, it depends because it depends on what you're actually building, how many tenants you might have, what type of workload, what type of system that you're building. The simplicity of having a single piece of infrastructure for your context may be worth it. Maybe for the size and scale of what you're doing, maybe you really want the alternative, which is a tenant per database. That means tenant A just hits our API and because we know its identity, we know what tenant it is, we can make our connection to the specific database for that tenant. We're not sharing any information. We're not sharing any schema. We don't have to worry about necessarily leaking any information or doing any type of query filtering. We're using the database specifically for that tenant. Same thing when tenant B makes a request, we're making a call, we're connecting to its specific database. So what are the pros and cons? Well, on the pro side, we've eliminated the issue of noisy neighbors because we have a database per tenant. They can't affect each other. Assuming that you're connecting to the right database, we've eliminated the issue of leaking data from other tenants. So we don't really need that query filter. On the con side, you can add more complexity because you have more infrastructure to deal with. You have a database per tenant. If you have a lot of tenants, you're gonna have a lot of databases. 
And here's the thing, if you make some type of schema change and your code reflects that schema change, when that's released and deployed into, into production, you have to make all those schema changes to all your tenant databases. A solution to this is isolating your API to a specific tenant, just like we're doing with the database. So tenant A hits the API specifically for it, which then connects to its specific database. Tenant B has its own instance separately of the API, which connects to its database. Well, hang on though, that's not even multi-tenant anymore, but I'm using it to illustrate that you can mix and match. That means that we could share resources or not share resources, both at our application layer and our database and other infrastructure. For my example here, tenant A, it's connecting to pool one, our application's running there, and then maybe we have a shared database for tenant A and B, so that way when tenant B connects, it's connecting to that same app pool, and then it's using the database, but we could have a separate tenant, tenant C, which a completely different instance, and it completely could be private database, could be a shared database if we add new tenants. The benefit to this with this mix and matching is that if we do make a schema change related to our application code, maybe we just deploy that to tenant A and B in app pool one in their specific database. That way tenant C doesn't get that change yet until we know we roll it out, everything's verified. We can slowly release this across all our different tenants. Now you may be thinking that sounds like an awful lot of complexity. It is, and you may not need it. It often depends on your context. Do you have a lot of tenants? How big is the system that you're rolling out? This all kind of skews on whether you want shared, whether you want individual, whether you want kind of this hybrid model. It really is on all these different kind of pros and cons that I've been talking about and all these trade-offs. Now, if you're in this hybrid model where you have shared data, I highly recommend that any identifiers like my customer ID be globally unique. The reason is if you're pulling things, you may decide to migrate a tenant from one database instance to another. You're gonna want global IDs in this case, so that you don't have any collisions. A lot of what we're doing here is building isolation if you need it. I'll have a link to a video that I've done about the bulkhead pattern. That's exactly that, building isolation. It'll be linked at the end of this video. So when building out your multi-tenant system, there's a lot of things to consider. What are the number of tenants that you're gonna have? Will the number of tenants that you have affect performance and have that noisy neighbor issue? They could be producing a lot of data. Depends on what your application is. The volume of data, will that affect other tenants? Maybe you do want to have that isolation. Prevent noisy neighbors as well as data leakage and performance concerns. There are things like the just the actual cost of the infrastructure of having many different databases, as well as kind of that development operational side of when you need to deploy changes, how many tenants are you deploying that to? You're gonna to have to build out some automation potentially to deal with this versus just having a single shared da uh, database for all your tenants. Your context matters and kind of navigating what matters to you in that given context is ultimately where you'll land on whether you have a shared database, whether you have database per tenant, some type of hybrid model, you got a lot of options. If you built a multi-tenant system, let me know in the comments the route that you went, kind of the decisions that you made, those trade-offs, what was important to you? Give me a little bit of context. If you enjoy topics like this and you wanna chat with other software developers about software architecture design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, informative in any way, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.